All right, I want you to open your Bibles this evening to the Bible. (laughs) That is our text, and uh, we could just walk out into the hall and read it together. We put the whole thing up there on the wall for you so that we can sort of move left to right and, and read it. In fact, as you think about the Bible wall, I don't know if it has brought to any conclusions to your own mind, just about the way the Bible is made up. You, you can see on that wall, song, poetry indented. Uh, you can see narrative in block paragraphs. Uh, you can see the proportions of Old Testament to New Testament. Maybe you've been struck at the Bible wall by thinking, oh, I've just been hanging out in Colossians this year and leaving out so much of what God has to say. Um, I hope that what you've grasped from that Bible wall is, wow, I can see the whole thing. I I could read that. I I could read that. Uh, and, And I hope that's an encouragement to you because God put his word in print, in scripturated form, that which stays. It doesn't move. It's not oral tradition. It's not lost by telephone game but it is in a permanent form so that we could know him, so that we could bank our lives on that which is not shifting sand, but solid rock. So what I want to do this evening, this is sort of a kickoff to our 66 books series. I have since discovered that other churches have have done this. And uh, Route 66, you know, that might have been a good name for us in Arizona. But at any rate, 66 books, and Ashley Anderson is going to kick us off next week by covering Genesis in 50 minutes. 50, five, zero minutes. Not 50 hours, 50 minutes. Um, and then the next week we'll get Exodus, and then Leviticus, and Numbers, all the way through 66 Sunday nights. And the, the hope here is that we get a survey of Scripture in sort of an overview form. And I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to try to summarize a book to somebody in 10 minutes. How do you get the main ideas? How do you get the themes? How do you highlight the the author's artistry and literary development and character development? You can't do all of that. Otherwise, you would just stand there and read the whole book. So this will no doubt be a disappointment to you because I will leave out your favorite verses this evening. Uh, We are going to hit some high points in the hopes that we get a big picture so that as you read your Bible, you can slot what you're reading where it goes. I think a tremendous help for this, if you haven't done it yet, is at some point in your life to read a chronological Bible or pick up a chronological Bible reading plan and and read your Bible the way that it is, uh, the way that it unfolds over history. Uh, The way that our Bibles are arranged in our English Bibles, is not the same as the order in which events happened. So sometimes a chronological Bible reading is helpful to realize, oh, this prophet goes with this narrative event, or this came before that. So what I want to do this evening, uh, we'll have a, a slide up that just gives us descriptions of sort of these high points. And I've picked out 24 high points for us to work on together. Uh, I hope Maybe we can memorize these. It sounds, may, sounds harder, may sound harder than it actually is. I think these words will tell a story so that by the end of the evening, we might be able to sort of rehearse these together. Now, if I were cleverer than I am, or if I were Omri Miles, they would all rhyme. So we're going to go creation, fall, flood, dispersion, promise, family, that kind of thing. But I could have said creation, devastation, inundation. I didn't do that. So you're going to be disappointed. Uh, If I'd worked harder at it, perhaps we could have made that happen. I was talking to Zach Can this week about this project. And he said, oh, I know what I would do. Zach, tell me, what would you do? He said, well, I'd spend about a half hour in Genesis, and I'd spend about 29 minutes in Revelation. And then the minute in between is just how do you get from point A to point B? And he's not wrong. The Bible, in one sense, is very much an Eden to Eden narrative. If you think about the way your Bible is constructed, you have four sinless chapters. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Revelation 21, and Revelation 22. When sin entered the world and death through sin, 
everything changed. That is the watershed mark for history. What happens in Genesis 3. But you need to understand that it is not inherent to God's created order to have sin and death and a curse. It is not intrinsic to the fundamental definition of humanity to be sinful. Okay, and before you throw me out on a rail for being heretical, it is of course intrinsic to us to sin. We sin by nature. That is inevitable. But if you think about it for a moment, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were sinless in fellowship with God. And every one of the redeemed in Revelation 21 and 22 is not only sinless, but unable to sin and in immediate fellowship in the very presence of God. Now, everything in between there is a mess. And in a very real sense, when Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden and humanity no longer is allowed to walk with God in the cool of the day in the garden, but a cherubim with a flaming sword is guarding the entrance and God has essentially said, you must leave. For the glory of God would incinerate sinful beings. The big question for humanity is, how do we get back in? And wonderfully, the great answer from God is His sovereign grace, that which we just sung about. Now, when we think about the Bible as a whole, it's helpful sometimes to put a theme over the whole thing. And and there are any number of things we might think is the theme of the Bible. And in fact, what comes to mind, probably most often to us who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, is we think the theme of the Bible is redemption or salvation. And while that is a prominent theme in the Bible, I'm not convinced it covers all the territory that the Bible covers. And what I mean by that is this. Not everybody goes to heaven. Not everybody is transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved son. Not everybody is taken out from under the tyranny of sin and placed under the reign of grace. But only those who believe. Only those who are saved by grace through faith. That one salvation plan from beginning to end that is God's universal plan for the redemption of sinners from beginning to end. Only the believers go to heaven. So there is a theme that covers the contents of the Bible that is bigger an umbrella than the umbrella of salvation. Does that make sense? It must actually cover the themes of God's holy, beautiful, bright, clean goodness, His unflinching justice reacting in the presence of unrepentant sin. It it must also cover judgment. So I would propose to you a theme for the Bible that is something like this. The glory of God as King who judges and saves. We might say that is the banner for all of Scripture. And and you could reword that any number of different ways. But I think the glory of God as King in judgment and salvation may capture the message of the Bible. Now the pointed message within that is you must be in a right relationship to that King. And there's something we need to understand about the the storyline of the Bible before we get into sort of 25 highlights that narrate the story in a big picture fashion. It it begins beyond the beginning. The opening line of our Bibles is, in the beginning, and then you find out very quickly, something predates the beginning. And what is that something? That is God himself. He is infinite and eternal, and that eternality is an eternality past. And just as a starting point, and we learn this from the rest of Scripture, that God was complete and satisfied and content and happy and glorious in His being prior to the created universe. God was not needy. God was not lonely. We find out that God is a Trinitarian Godhead, three persons, one essence, and perfect, sinless, beautiful, wonderful, infinitely delightful inner Trinitarian fellowship predated the created order. And if you want a brief essay on why then did God create, I would suggest to you Jonathan Edwards, the end for which God created the world. 
So you can footnote that, look that up later. Jonathan Edwards tackles the question of why did an infinitely beautiful, glorious, wonderful, satisfied, complete, not needy God create a finite universe? Uh, that's a great question. That will bring us to one of the great themes of the Bible that we will trace this evening. So here's the plan for tonight. We're, we're going to walk through 24 highlight sort of data points, events in the Bible. And then we'll back up and trace some themes that course through those events. Uh, let's begin with creation. So on the screen, first word, let's all say it together out loud. So you've got it memorized already. Excellent job. You could repeat that when you get home. No problem. We're doing good so far. And now if they all rhymed, it would be easier. Creation. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this word for created, the Hebrew word bara, is a word only predicated of God. We might talk about being creative. All we do is rearrange what God made. God, on the other hand, created ex nihilo. That is, he created everything out of nothing. He spoke all things into existence. And Genesis, of course, gives us the creation week where God brought everything into existence. At the end of the creation week, God, of course, created man. Look down at Genesis 1.26. He said, let us, there's those Trinitarian relationships, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth, over every every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Behold, I've given you. And God describes the smorgasbord that he provided for mankind. What do we have there in the first days of creation? God creates everything. He says it's good. And God puts a being, a finite created being, Made in his likeness. Made in his image. And we're going to get some themes that emerge from the very beginning. Happiness in fellowship with God is man's design. Created in God's image is design. And rulership for man is God's design. God has put man as a sub-regent on the earth to rule his created order. And so when you look in the first two chapters of the Bible, again, these sinless chapters, man's relationship to God is intimate fellowship. Man's relationship to man is perfect. There is no sin. Uh, they, They can communicate. Adam and Eve can communicate with one another with no misgivings, no sin, nothing to repent of, nothing to fix. Just the enjoyment of man and woman fellowshipping in the garden. Can you imagine Man's relationship to his world was wonderful. The created world yielded to man's labors. By the way, there was labor before the fall. You're you're going to work every day is not a result of the fall. The fact that work stinks is a result of the fall. But there was work before the fall. And there will be work in the last two chapters of the Bible as well. And here, work was only fun all the time. Man's relationship to God was perfect. Man's relationship to man was harmony. Man's relationship to the world was not frustrated. Man's relationship to work was always fun. Man's relationship to sin was, they didn't. Now that didn't last very long. We have the next highlight event here. From creation we move to fall. Right? Let's say those together out loud. Creation, fall. This is Genesis 3 and the fall of man. And and you know this story. The serpent more crafty than any beast of the field is the incarnation of this arch enemy of God, Satan, the great serpent of old, the dragon. Uh, We learn about him later in scripture. He has come uh, in an incarnate fashion, taken on the body of this serpent. And he throws doubt at God's word before the man and the woman. They believe the snake rather than God. They sin. 
And they sinned by choice, but ushered all of humanity into a sinning by nature, an inherited nature that would rebel against God from this point forward for all of human history down to this very day. And it puts the whole world in attention. Romans 8 tells us that the created order is frustrated under the burden of the curse of God. Ecclesiastes 7 says that God bent the universe and nobody can straighten it. Now, what is the reason for all of that? God will not allow man to live forever and live in his immediate presence while in a sinful condition. So then man is excluded from the garden. This becomes the great and awful tragedy. Some things emerge right here immediately in this fall. Look down at verse 15 of Genesis 3. God here speaks to the snake and says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush you on the head and you will crush his heel. So the the snake gets a promise from God That the man and the woman would bear seed, particularly the woman would would have seed. What do we know about seed up to this point in our Bible? Well, trees have fruit with seed after them that produce the same kind of tree that it came from. And now the woman's going to have seed that's going to crush the snake. This great enemy, a deceiver and murderer who has brought the onslaught of death and sin into the human race and enmity now with God will ultimately be crushed, crushed by a seed of the woman. We also have here in, again, sort of seed form, this idea of substitution. Look at verse 21. Yahweh God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. One of the themes we'll see through our Bible is the theme of substitution. Here is the first substitution. Where do skins of animals come from? Walmart. No, dead animals. Animals had to be killed so that the sin and the guilt of humanity could be covered. Uh, An innocent dies in the place of the guilty to bring us to God. We have here also uh, remarkable uh, promises that are going out. Um, Promises that the ground would be cursed, but promises that man would eat. A promise that the woman would uh, endure pain in childbirth and yet promise that the seed promise would keep going because there would be marriage. Man and woman would be together. After the fall, all we just have this litany of death, the result in Genesis 5. You've got the table of generations of people who lived and then died. We come next to the highlight event The flood. So creation, fall, flood. Let's say that together. Creation, fall, flood. Okay, now we're in Genesis 6 through 9. What is God doing there? Genesis 6, 5, Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. There's a a theology of man and a theology of sin in that verse means mankind doesn't have good intentions, he just messes up. No, he has terrible intentions. And depravity has affected every capacity of the human constitution so that he is a rebel against God in what he wants to do and in what he does. The internal nature and the external actions. And God sends a flood to decimate the earth, to remove mankind from the face of the earth, except... This judgment is coupled with a salvation. Eight people preserved in a box over the floodwaters. From them, God makes and repopulates humanity on the earth. Our next major event is Genesis 11, and it is dispersion. So, creation, fall, flood, dispersion. Are we good so far? Can we take that home? Creation, fall, flood, dispersion. Genesis 11. The whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, let's make make bricks. They said, let's build ourselves a city and a tower that will reach to heaven. 
And we will make a name for ourselves so that we won't be scattered over the whole earth. Well, this is directly in violation of God's plan for humanity. They're not to make a name for themselves. They're to glory in the name of God. And they're not supposed to gather in one tower and build it as high to heaven as they can get. They're supposed to fill the earth with God's image bearers and subdue the created order. They are in rebellion against God in the plain and their tower is so massive, so lofty, so huge that God has to come down to see it. It's fascinating language in Genesis 11. And he smashes it and he disperses the nations. Look what happens. Yahweh scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth. Uh, some believe that the, the scattering there was the confusion of languages so they couldn't talk to each other so they just sort of wandered away from each other. Uh, I, I think rather God scattered them, placed them in the various parts of the earth. Whatever view you have here, the beginnings of nations, the divisions of peoples and ethnicities and tongues and languages. We're going to see that theme through our Bible. We see that what man has done in rebellion and the division of languages and ethnicities is God's response to sin. It is actually judgment becomes a beautiful panorama of diversity in humanity that God will redeem. So that surrounding the throne of the Lamb in Revelation 5, you have people rescued from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. That's a theme that's going to pervade the whole Bible. Uh, man does evil and God rescues, God redeems, God beautifies, God glorifies. We move from dispersion to a family. So we've scattered the nations around the earth, and now the Bible's narrative is going to zoom in on a family, Genesis 12. So let's say it together. Creation, fall, flood, dispersion, family. Okay, this is Genesis 12. Did I put promise up there first? Incubation. Oh, man. I don't know what's going on. I left out some words. Is there not a slide that says family or promise or anything like that? I really, okay, we're not, this isn't going to be helpful at all. You're not going to be able to memorize this. You don't have to type it in, Daniel. Sorry, we're, we're going to memorize it. Here we go. Creation, fall, flood, dispersion, family. We'll go with family here. So, now Yahweh said to Abram, go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house to the land I will show you. Uh, and here begins God selecting a man, an idolater, a polygamist, a worshiper of pagan deities, called out by grace to belong to God. To, to, to be allowed to walk around calling on God and, and, and taking God's name and, and God calling his name. This is going to be the beginning of a refrain we'll see throughout the Bible. I will be their God and they will be my people. And then this incipient family is given promise. Look at verse 2. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you I will curse. In you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Remarkable series of promises here. Uh, a promise for a people and for land and for blessing and then the extension of blessing even beyond the family that's created here. It's interesting that the book of Genesis covers roughly 2,300 years in world history. If you leave out the book of Revelation for a moment that extends into the millennial kingdom and new heavens, new earth, eternal state, if you take Revelation out... The book of Genesis covers more time than all the other books of the Bible combined. Just a vast span of time covered as God brings us through creation, fall, flood, dispersion, family, and promise. And these promises laid out, we're only 12 chapters in, a few pages into our Bibles, and God is laying out the roadmap whereby He will save people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people where he will reverse the curse, where he will give blessing and bring back happiness, fellowship with him. Our next highlight event is incubation. And this really just refers to this family 
less than 100 people moving into Egypt because of circumstances and then kept there 430 years and coming out with nearly 2 million people. And in the ancient Near East, to, to be a sort of a Bedouin family, uh, agricultural uh, at times, but most often sheep herding, following herds from place to place, being mobile, living in tents, you were vulnerable. And God took his little family that he was creating and incubated this family underneath the protection of the world's superpower at the time, Egypt. And they got special provision, special grace, a a place to live, and then eventually slavery. But God was incubating a nation, growing a nation, and when that population was probably a little over 2 million God led them out of slavery. We would call this emancipation. So creation, fall, flood, dispersion, family, promise, incubation. Oh good, look at that, they're up there. And emancipation. Emancipation. This of course is a reference to the Exodus, 1445 BC. And look at Exodus chapter 12. This is the scene that culminates the drama of the plagues poured out on Egypt. God hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he wouldn't let them go so that he could demonstrate to a watching world that God was the God of Israel. He was the only God in charge of all things. He was the God over all so-called gods. And he, the special God of Israel, was stronger than the mighty superpower Egypt. And a series of plagues would tell the world for ages to come that the God of Israel is the one true God. It was also the means by which God got them out of slavery. And it was also the means by which God foreshadowed what he would be doing with substitution. We talked about those animal sacrifices that were made so that sins could be covered by animal skins. Now we move to the Passover in Exodus 12 where an angel of destruction passed over the homes that were covered by blood of an innocent lamb slain for sinful people. Israel was rescued as a nation. The sea was divided in Exodus 14. And Israel was out into the desert, escaped from Egypt. Out in the desert, they received their constitution. That's our next word. Let's pause and say these together again. Creation, fall, flood, dispersion, family, promise, incubation, emancipation, constitution. By constitution, this is the sort of foundational documents for this new nation. God is going to be working with a nation, a geopolitical entity. This is a mixed crowd. There are believers and unbelievers that make up this nation that will be uh, beneficiaries of God's promises and protection and provision. And he tells them what to do. God here redeems them, reveals himself, and regulates his people. This is a pattern you see throughout scripture. God saves his people, he reveals himself to his people, and he regulates their lives. Exodus 20, of course, is the Decalogue or the Ten Words or the Ten Commandments. Sort of a summary statement of the law that God gives them. This is the constitutional obligations of the people. Look at Exodus 34. A key text in this constitutional period. Here God is revealing himself to his people. And we read in verse 6, Yahweh passed by in front of him and proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and the grandchildren to third and fourth generation. This is the great problem of the Old Testament. This is the great problem of man's dealings with God. As long as God is holy and man is sinful. How can God maintain his reputation as holy and pure and clean and good and still have any business with the likes of us? He desires to be gracious and compassionate and to forgive sin and yet he will not leave guilt unpunished. How does that work? 
And this revelation of God to his people gets back to one of these themes that we're tracing. A theme of substitution. And so in the very constitution where God is revealing himself and regulating his people, he lays out the principle of substitution. Leviticus 19.2 says uh, that you are to be holy even as I am holy. And Leviticus 17.11 tells that there is life in the blood of sacrificial animals which qualifies them to go as a go-between Listen to Leviticus 17, 11. The life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of life that makes the atonement. And we get this clearer picture as revelation progresses. That God is providing a means by which sinners can be made right before a holy God by sacrificial substitution. This leads, of course, to the wandering. Um, Looking at Exodus 23.20, we get this warning. And God says, Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way, to bring you into the place which I have prepared, Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression since my name is in him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. My angel will go before you. That we find out later on that this angel of Yahweh is none other than a personage who is Yahweh, who is preparing the way, ensuring the promises, paving the way for the people to receive a people, land, and blessing. This angel of Yahweh will show up again. Getting them into the land, God warned them, don't rebel. What did the people do? They rebelled. This leads to our next word, wandering. We come to the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy. And the book of Numbers tells us uh, about the rebellion of Israel in their desert trek. It would have been a short trip to leave Egyptian slavery and walk right into the land of promise. But you have a series of sins, a series of ten sins that culminates in Numbers 13. In Numbers 13, spies were sent into the land that God had promised. God said, I will give you this land. I'll clear your enemies away before you. It is yours. This is an offer of God's kindness and grace to the people. Spies went into the land to check it out. And they said, yes, this is a land flowing with milk and honey. It is fruitful. Look at these big piles of grapes we've brought back. It's even harvest time. This is going to be wonderful. But... The giants that live there are too big for us. We're like grasshoppers at their knees. They did not believe the God who just took them out from under the world's superpower, brought them through the Red Sea, provided for everything that they needed, couldn't take care of a few Hittites. And so they were forced to wander in the wilderness. Forty years they were in the desert doing circles. And in the last steps of that wandering, God delivers them the book of Deuteronomy through Moses. Moses, the prophet, delivers this sermon. You're about to enter the land and you need to be faithful to Yahweh. In Deuteronomy 10, God tells the people, you have a heart problem and you need your heart to be surgically fixed. He called it circumcision of the heart. In Deuteronomy 30, God said, you will disobey me. You will be exiled from the land after I take you there. And you're going to forfeit all the blessings that I would promise to you. But I will circumcise your hearts and eventually I will bring you back into the land. And I'll send another prophet and you should listen to him. All of this in the midst of the people's rebellious wanderings in the desert. That leads to our next word, conquest. Creation, fall, flood, dispersion, family, promise, incubation, emancipation, constitution, wandering, and now conquest. Israel goes into the land. 
led by Joshua. You can read about him in the book of Joshua. There is faith there and failure. Sometimes they trusted the Lord, sometimes they didn't. That leads to a cycle of judges. There were those that God would raise up to fight for the people and to judge them, but those become cycles of rebellion. We find out in Judges 3, 7 that when Israel got into the land, they worshipped the Baals and the Ashereths. That is, they worshipped the gods of the people who were there, directly in violation of what God said. The book of Judges closes with this phrase, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The period of the Judges was a downward spiral of rebellion and rescue, rebellion and rescue that got worse and worse and worse. After the cycle of judges, we do get a king. And the king that the people called for, which was actually sin, they didn't want Yahweh to fight their battles. They wanted a a real guy right there to, to go out before them and fight their battles for them. Someone big and strong. Someone like Saul. Impressive. Well, Saul was not a good king. He did not love Yahweh. In fact, his installment as king was a judgment against the nation for rejecting God as king. And yet, at the same time, it is exactly what God is planning to install a man as king on the earth over his people. That has been his plan. God's plan for Adam was to be king of the earth, for his descendants to be kings of the earth, and to rule and subdue the earth. Adam failed, Israel calls for a king, and and he fails, and and then you get the united kingdom. After Saul, you have David, who is a man after God's own heart, and David's son, Solomon. And Saul, David, and Solomon are the only ones to rule over all 12 tribes as one nation. In 1 Kings 8, Solomon dedicates the temple of God. He worships God, leads the nation in the worship of God, and three chapters later in 1 Kings 11 we find out that Solomon has given himself over in love to his many foreign wives who loved and worshipped other gods. So Solomon, the son of David, built altars to foreign gods in the land of Israel. Again, in violation of God, faithless disobedience to God. And then you end up with a divided kingdom. Ten tribes in the north with no good kings in their entire history. Two tribes in the south with some good kings, some bad kings. And the cycles of idol worship eventually lead to both the northern tribes and the southern tribes being exiled from the land. The northern tribes exiled to Assyria in 722 BC and the southern tribes in 605 to Babylon After the exile, you get the return to the land. Their return to the land was not glorious. This becomes the times of the Gentiles. They're still under Persian rule, eventually Greek rule and Roman rule. They're back in the land and they're not living the glory days that were the apex under David and Solomon. And then you get silence. How do we summarize the Old Testament here? Creation, fall, flood, dispersion, family, promise, incubation, emancipation, constitution, wandering, conquest, judges, united kingdom, divided kingdom, exile, and then return. And then silence. In all of this, there are some themes running through. We we are looking for one who is the fulfillment of certain promises. Where is that seed who would crush the snake? Genesis 3.15. If we're following the Genesis 12 promise, the Abrahamic covenant, where is the one who will bring about this blessing to all peoples? If we're looking at the promises made to David in 2 Samuel 7, we're looking for the Davidic son who is obedient, who brings about a a kingdom that will never end. And in all of these things, in the Old Testament narrative, we are left with mere humans who are disappointments, who can't bring about what was lost in the Garden of Eden, who can't bring about what was promised in Genesis 3.15 or Genesis 12 or 2 Samuel 7. All of these promises are left undone. They're like the, the ends of rope unraveled. 
And then God is silent for 400 years, the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The next slide gives a sort of graph of where our Old Testament books fit in chronologically. Uh, if I uh, just took that out of um, uh, Paul Benware's book, the Old Testament Survey. Uh, so you can find that there. Um, or if you want a copy of that from the notes, just email me. I'd be glad to send that to you. And you can see there, as you're reading your Bible, where do the books that I'm reading fit into this chronology? And in the space between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we are left with one particular thread that is just begging for an answer. And that is that seed promise in Genesis 3.15. In fact, if, if you go back to Genesis 3, you have Adam and Eve apparently present when God is talking to the snake and saying, that woman's going to have seed that will crush you. And then he tells the woman, you're going to have childbirth, you're going to bring forth children. Adam could have called his wife a lot of things. He called her Eve, mother of living, mother of all living. And they believe God's promise about a seed coming through her that will crush the snake. And we come to Genesis 4. The man had relationships with his wife Eve. She conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child. Yahweh. It's kind of what the Hebrew reads. With the help of is an addition in our English Bibles. It is very strange and cryptic phraseology is Eve here in Genesis 4.1 anticipating a divine being being the seed promise fulfillment is very interesting of course Cain wasn't Abel wasn't Cain was a murderer Abel was dead and then they have another child look down at verse 25 Adam had relations with his wife again she gave birth to a son and named him Seth for she said, God has appointed, there's the idea of Seth, has appointed me a seed in place of Abel. What was Eve saying? Well, it wasn't Cain, it wasn't Abel, but God said, there's going to be a seed from me that crushes the head of the snake. Who is it? Seth? And of course, as you follow this forward in your Bible, Seth's not it. You follow the, the genealogy of death in Genesis 5. Adam lived and he died, verse 5. Seth lived and died, verse 8. Enosh lived and died, verses 10 and 11. Kenan died, verse 14. Mahalalel died, uh, verse 17. Uh, Jared died, 20. Um, Enoch, Methuselah. Of course, you have um, Enoch, verse 24, walked with God and he was not for God took him. One exception to the death genealogy. Methuselah died. Lamech, verse 28, lived 182 years and became the father of a son. And he called his name Rest. <laughs> called his name Noah. This one's going to give us rest from the curse. And you see in your Old Testament this anticipation with, with every male, every baby born in the line of promise. The anticipation. Is this him? And if we were reading our Bibles sort of left to right for the very first time, we might with this same anticipation be looking around the corner for the next guy. Is it him? Is it him? Is it him? And in Genesis 12, it gets narrowed down to Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob, who gets renamed Israel. And then Jacob's sons gets narrowed down to Judah. And we're looking in this line for who's it going to be? In 2 Samuel 7, we, we see it's narrowed down further from the line of Judah to the personage of David and his descendants. And I wish we could see in our English Bibles the word seed everywhere it shows up. Because this seed anticipation is a deafening silence in the 400 silent years. Now, God's not speaking through prophets. There are no more kings. We're under the thumb of the Romans. Where is hope? How are these unraveled threads all going to be put back together? And then you get John the Baptist in the New Testament. We come to the period of the incarnation. 
and one showing the way. And you might think, well, John the Baptist is it. He's, he's weird, he's holy, he eats funny food and wears funny clothes, and he's calling everybody to repent. And of course, John the Baptist isn't the guy, and he says, I'm not the guy. And he points to Jesus of Nazareth and says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if you're following your Bible storyline at this point, you know what lambs are. They're hapless victims and they're instruments of substitutionary sacrifice. And God has provided lambs to take away sin in the sacrificial system, though in a temporary way. And we've been looking for a seed promise from the line of David who could actually fulfill the Genesis 3.15 and the Genesis 12 and the 2 Samuel 7 promises of God to reverse the curse, install the perfect man who will be king over the earth. And we're looking and looking and looking and every character in the Old Testament has been a disappointment. And John the Baptist comes along and says, behold, it's him. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. And that leads us to the incarnation, the the, the birth and the earthly life and the ministry and the teaching of Jesus Christ, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. As a fulfillment of Zechariah, he would ride in on the foal of a donkey. In fulfillment of Isaiah 61, he's the one who reads the scroll in the synagogue and says, good news is preached to the poor. This is fulfilled today in your hearing. And in both of those Old Testament promised texts, it is said of Jesus in his earthly life here that he fulfilled the first half of it and not the second half of it. That is, he came, but he did not conquer. He arrived, but he did not take over rulership of a united kingdom on David's throne in Jerusalem, and the curse is not yet reversed. The people are not in the land and secure and receiving divine blessing. And there are other things that have been going on in the anticipation of the Christ. And you may remember the song of him in Isaiah 53. Oh yes, the Old Testament portrayed this promised one, this expected one, as a king who would come and rule. But it also portrayed him as a suffering servant of Yahweh who would come and be pierced for transgressions, Zechariah 12.10 says. He would be crushed for our iniquities, Isaiah 53 says. And that is exactly what Jesus of Nazareth came and did. He was no mere man. His beginnings were from long ago, that is from eternity past. This is indeed God in the flesh. And if you're tracing another theme in your Bible, you might be asking, where does God dwell? And we found out that in the garden, God dwelled with Adam and Eve in immediate presence with them, walking in the cool of the day. And in the wilderness, God was so gracious to be near his people without incinerating them. And so you had the tabernacle and ceremonies, sort of shields between sinful men and a holy God, but allowed gracious access for God to dwell in their midst. And then a more permanent version of the tabernacle in the temple. David wanted to build it. Solomon built the materials David had collected into that temple dedicated in 1 Kings 8. And God dwelt there and his glory inhabited that in the midst of the people. And then the glory left the temple. And then you get this statement in John 1.14. The word was with God, was God, The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Where does God dwell now? Well, in the incarnation, he was with us. He was among us, unrecognized by most. He was here. And that, of course, leads to his crucifixion, his death, burial, resurrection, and his departure. The king came. Not to rule the first time, but to suffer as a substitutionary sacrifice. The Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And then the king left. And he left his people to do something particular. I know I've left off of our words here. Incarnation, crucifixion, and then, what do I have next? Nations. We could could put the church in there. The king left... 
And now instead of the world, if it was going to know the God of Israel would come to Jerusalem to meet with the God of Israel in Israel, now God is going to scatter his people to the ends of the earth to take the message of his forgiveness of sin and grace in the death of his son to the nations. Every tongue, tribe, nation, and people would eventually believe and be a part of his people. This new mission was a surprise to the Old Testament. The Old Testament does not prophesy the church, does not describe Jew and Gentile together in one body. The Old Testament does promise that God would, through Abraham, be a blessing to the nations. But this idea that God would put Jew and Gentile together in one group and then tabernacle in them. Again, where does, the, where does God dwell? You, plural, are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And you, individual Christian, are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is a temple, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6. That is plural and individualized. Now where does God dwell? In these individual temples going out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth to the ends of this age. That is the age of nations. And then we get the tribulation. The tribulation is the next period in God's timeline in the Bible. This is Daniel's 70th week. This is what we'll be looking at in Revelation 6 through 18. This is God finishing his dealings and keeping his promises to Israel. His Deuteronomy 28 and 29 promises. There would be judgment, exile, dispersion, and a bringing back, and a circumcision of heart, and a giving of blessing. God's going to finish what he started with an ethnic people and a nation. And if you follow the relationship between Jews and Gentiles through your Bible, you get to this really interesting phase. Really a strange phase. It it just happens to be the one that we live in and it feels kind of normal. But it's the phase where Gentiles, outsiders to the covenant promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, get grafted in like a horticulturist cuts off a branch from one tree and grafts it into another tree and lets it grow there and benefit from the nutrients that come from its roots and then produce fruit on that limb. We are those outsiders, the Gentiles who got grafted into God's plan. Meanwhile, the natural branches, and I'm here referring to Romans 11, the natural branches cut off for unbelief. That is, when Messiah came, for the most part, Israel rejected her Messiah and is still under the thumb of Gentiles, is not under the blessing and the promises of God, has not en masse received circumcision of heart, has not turned to the Lord in faith. But God promises in Romans eleven twenty seven 27 that they will, as a nation, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, the partial hardening of Israel will be over and all Israel will be saved, says the Apostle Paul. And so if you're looking for the you are here dot, that's us. We're in this period called the nations prior to the tribulation. The tribulation is the finishing of God's work with Israel, where he will bring about their repentance He will bring about the purification of his people. And that leads to the return of the king. The return of the king. After the tribulation, Jesus the Messiah comes back to the earth in Revelation 19. And in Revelation 20, he establishes his kingdom, which will last for a thousand years. A time in which Satan will be bound. The world culture will be Jesus culture. That is, he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. He will be physically present and the government will rest on his shoulders. He's a good king. And there will be world peace and there will be prosperity and there will be blessing across the globe. It will be the best phase of human history. It will be the closest to Eden that humanity has been yet. But it gets better. Because even that period is a period marked by death. Isaiah 11 describes death during the millennial kingdom. uh, But someone who dies at 100 years will be considered but a youth. But there is still the curse, still sin, ameliorated in great ways. 
until Revelation 21 and 22. Turn there real quick. After the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth, after the great white throne judgment where Jesus himself judges all the living and the dead, we come to Revelation 21. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth The first heaven and the first earth passed away. There is no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them. They will be his people. God himself will be among them. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. No longer any death. No longer mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Do you recognize that everything up until Revelation 21 is first things? It's on this side of the timeline. There's a hard break and the next things go on forever. And for those who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Lamb slain for sin, forever and ever and ever in unending infinitely increasing delight in the immediate presence of God. This is Eden regained and never to be lost. What Adam and Eve had for a short time, believers in Jesus Christ will have forever. And it's hard for us to comprehend. Sometimes forever just seems so big that it itself is scary. We can't imagine what, and I just can't take forever. Forever. But God has given us by his common grace and by his special graces enjoyable things even in this cursed world. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and receives favor from the Lord. A good meal, a good job, good relationships, the church, the sun rising and the rain falling. All of these things are kindnesses Benevolences from God that are foreshadows, foretastes of an infinite version of joy, delight, happiness, and pleasure that will never end, never be tarnished, never fade, never be diminished. That is where it all goes. The Bible truly is an Eden to Eden story. I believe the great promise of the Bible. Remember we talked about the overarching theme of the Bible. The glory of God as king in judgment and salvation. Now I'm going to give you the great promise of the Bible. I want you to turn to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 picks up on the refrain begun in that constitutional period with Israel in the wilderness with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the patriarchs before them. And it is this wonderful invitation. Two sinners from God. Yo, attention getter. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what's not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will be your God and you will be my people. This gracious invitation from God offended by our sin and eager to cover our sin with his own son's blood. This invitation is answered with the fulfillment in Revelation 21.3. Behold, the tabernacle of God is among them. He will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God will be among them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. What is the great promise of the Bible? God desires to dwell with his people. He desires for his own glory and goodness and kindness and grace, his 
fountainhood, we might call it. He is an infinite springing fountain of water that just gives and gives and gives because he is infinite in his nature and exuberant in his goodness and he created so that we would be an audience that could receive it and enjoy it. And we get to be in that presence, forever delighting in him, the source of all good things. That is the story of the Bible. We'll see it unfolded book by book over the next 66 Sunday nights. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this, your word. We are amazed that you brought your word to us. You put it in our language. You sent messengers who were bold enough to tell us that we had a problem that only you could solve. And you made us alive by your grace. Thank you. God, we ask that we would be heralds of this great and glorious message all the days that you give us on this earth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.